to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim good news unto the poor. The gospel of Christ, spreading the soul-saving message of Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. A great question is asked in Jeremiah 37, verse number 17. Is there any word from the Lord? We welcome you today to our study of Bible Questions and Answers. In this series of lessons, we're answering questions that have been submitted by you, our viewers, either through our email address, questions at thegospelofchrist.com, or through our website, thegospelofchrist.com, slash questions. As always, we want to take these questions, look to the Word of God, and give a Thus saith the Lord, a Bible answer for these wonderful questions. And friend, we sure want to encourage you today to visit the Church of Christ in your area. These lessons are being brought, by, brought to you by members of the Church of Christ. They'd love for you to stop by and visit their assemblies. If you'd like to study further or learn more information about the Lord's Church, you can write to us or call us, and we'd be glad to help you in that endeavor. Now let's direct our attention to the first question that has been submitted by one of our viewers, and the question is this. Is listening to music, like rock or pop or even country music, a sin? For example, he says, I listen to pop and rock songs and it sometimes refers to sex or drugs or alcohol or, or things that are immoral, although I like that type of music. And so basically, a twofold question, is it wrong to listen to music, like country or rock or whatever it may be, pop, whatever it may be? Well, friend, music is something that God Himself has created. We find that throughout the Bible. We find great men of God involved in music and the, 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 the ability to sing and to play music. That's something that no doubt God Himself has given man the ability to do. And so music in and of itself is not wrong. We find several instances in the Old Bible, in the Old Testament, where people use music. For example, we find that King Saul used music and even certain instruments to calm himself at times uh, when he was distressed and things like that. David used to come in and play and that would at times calm him. And so we find nothing in the scripture to teach that music in and of itself is sinful. In fact, music, singing, is a part of worship to God. It's commanded by God. Colossians chapter 3 verse 17 and Ephesians chapter 5 verse 19. And so music is not inherently sinful. The Bible does not at all teach that. We find examples where it does have good qualities. But now maybe to the second part of the question even more. Is it sinful? to listen to some rock and roll song or some pop music or, or even some country song today that talks about sex or drugs or, or immorality. Well, friend, a Christian sure wants to make sure that what he brings into his mind and into his heart is wholesome and right in the sight of God. And so to listen to songs that are going to promote sex and violence or immorality or drinking and things like that, immorality, that's not something that a Christian wants to participate in. Let me give you an example. Listen to Philippians chapter 4. What kind of things ought I to be putting in my mind and filling my heart with? Philippians 4 verse 8. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue, if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. Those things which are right and good and things that will help us to, to live the Christian life, those are things that a Christian ought to be thinking upon. If I'm bringing words and thoughts and images into my mind, that deal with uh, sex, that deal with alcohol, that deal with adultery and immorality and, and violence. Friends, those are things that are going to be in my heart and on my mind and, and a Christian wants to think about things that are right, not things like unto that. And so, should a Christian listen to that type of music? 
No, a Christian shouldn't listen to music that is going to promote or is going to advance immoral things because those things, think about this. If I'm around somebody that cusses or I'm around uh, immorality or, or, I'm, or I see things that are not like they should be, things that are sinful and wrong, you know, those images and those words and, and those ideas kind of stick in my mind. You, you, you've heard it said, I've got a song stuck in my mind. What if that song and those words are immoral, ungodly things? What if you've got bad words to a song lyric stuck in your mind and that promotes uh, evil images or ideas? Are those things that ought to be on a Christian's heart and mind? Well, absolutely not. The Bible teaches we're to be pure, we're to be holy. Be holy as He who called you is holy. 1 Peter 1 verse 15. We're to, we're to think on things that are good. We're to have the mind of Christ. Philippians chapter 2 verse number 5. And so whether it's some rock song that's promoting sex and drugs, whether it's some uh, pop song that's promoting some immorality, or, and, and some of the worst today are the country songs that are promoting drinking and, and immorality and carousing and adultery, uh, who lost who and who got drunk and who did, you know, you've got all these songs that are just promoting things that are not right. A Christian ought to do his best to avoid bringing those thoughts and those words into his mind. The Bible says, I'm to bring every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. And thus, I ought to strive to listen. There's so much music that is, is good and wholesome. There's TV shows that are good and wholesome. There's other entertainment that is not immoral and ungodly. One can find alternatives, but even if you couldn't, you still shouldn't strive to listen to or try to listen to things that one knows are going to promote immorality and ungodliness. That would be contrary to the will of God. Let's now turn our attention to another question that has been submitted. What a wonderful question indeed this is. The question is asked, we recently had friends who took their baby to church to have it sprinkled. My wife and I have been discussing this. Is sprinkling of babies found in the Bible? Well, really, this is a twofold question. The first question would be, is sprinkling naturally found in the Bible itself? And friend, you don't find sprinkling as an authorized means of baptism. What do we find? John was baptizing in Anon where there was much water. John chapter 3, verse number 23. We find that at Jesus' baptism, coming up out of the water, the Spirit descended upon Him like a dove. Mark chapter 1, verses 9 through 10. We find that baptism is a burial. Romans 6, verses 1 through 4. And that both Philip and the eunuch got down out of the chariot, went down the water, he baptized him, and they came up out of the water. And so we first ask, is sprinkling found in the Bible? And friend, you do not find sprinkling in the Bible. That is not an authorized, that is not a mode of baptism that we find in Scripture. Here's what's interesting. There are two unique words for sprinkling and baptism, and both of them occur in the Bible. For example, in Hebrews chapter 9, we find, find the, the mention of the word sprinkling used for the sprinkling under the Old Testament of the blood of bulls and goats. It is the word rantizo, and it literally means sprinkling. And then you find the word baptizo used multiple times, and it means immersion. And so there was a Greek word for sprinkling. Baptism in the original language means immersion, and God chose to describe the process of going down into the water with baptism. To be a child of God, one must be immersed, not sprinkled. Now, what about the second part of that question? For there are a lot of good parents and who really want the best for their children and who want the best for their children spiritually. And so we hear somebody had their baby sprinkled and we think, well, hey, we want to make sure that our baby's where he needs to be spiritually. Do we need to take them down and have them sprinkled as well? Friend, the idea of sprinkling babies goes back to the idea of babies being born in sin. Why do people sprinkle babies? Because they believe that babies are born in sin and that if a baby is not baptized, that baby, if he dies, is going to die in sin. Since baptism is for the remission of sins, Acts 2 verse 38, people conclude therefore if babies have sin, if they're born in sin, they must be baptized or that baby is going to die and go to hell. 
Well, friend, here we have a false understanding of sin. The Bible teaches, according to Matthew 18, Jesus said, Do not forbid the little children, let them come to me, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 18, verses 1 through 13. And so Jesus recognized that children, little children, were pure, were innocent, and were not stained with sin. Isaiah chapter 7, verses 12 through 16 teaches, There is a time before the child knows to refuse the evil and choose the good. We sometimes refer to that time period that the Bible mentions there as the age of accountability. Child doesn't know to refuse evil. He doesn't know to choose the good. You've got a little uh, year old, two year old baby that likes chocolate chip cookies. And you say to that baby or you say to that toddler, you say now, no cookies until supper. He goes over and gets a cookie. Why did he do that? Is he defiant and rebellious? Well, no. He doesn't know yet. He's in that process where he's learning, but he is not to the point where he knows to refuse the evil and choose the good. He doesn't know when you say no cookies, that really means don't do that. To stop eating cookies and do what's right. You know, there's a process when you don't know, when you haven't reached that age of accountability. And friend, to help us understand that children are not born in sin, I want to direct your attention to an Old Testament passage in the book of Ezekiel. Look in Ezekiel chapter 18, if you would with me, and I want you to see that, that babies being born in sin, that's not something that we find taught throughout the Scripture. In fact, we're told in Scripture that one does not inherit or uh, is not born with the sins of others. Ezekiel chapter 18, I want you to notice what happens or what is said in verse number 20. The soul who sins shall die. Listen to this now. The son shall not bear the guilt of the father, nor the father bear the guilt of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. There was a proverb going around. You learn about it in Ezekiel 18, 1 and 2 in Israel. The fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. Basically it said uh, the father ate something sour and the son can taste it in his mouth. He didn't eat it, but because he's kin to the father, he can taste it. God said, do not use that proverb in Israel anymore. Why? Because the son shall not bear the guilt of the father. The father bear the guilt of the son, the soul who sins shall surely die. Ezekiel 18, verse number 4. And so this idea that, that, that babies are born in sin, the very reason people want to sprinkle them, that idea is false. You just don't find that taught in Scripture. Remember, Jesus said, Let the little children come to me, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. And so, does the Bible teach that young parents today who are concerned about their children's spiritual welfare need to run down and have them sprinkled? No, that's not what you find in the Bible. You find in the Bible that young parents today who are concerned about their children's spiritual welfare will bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, Ephesians 6 verses 1 through 4, who will teach them about God, teach them the Scriptures, show them the right way to live by their example, and do everything possible that when they reach that age of accountability, they know right from wrong, they understand sin, then they're ready to make a decision for themselves and obey the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We now direct our attention to another question that has been submitted by one of our viewers, and the question is asked like this. Please explain the history of instrumental music in the church. Is instrumental music something that has always existed, and should we use them today? Well, that's a good question. When did mechanical instruments of music actually become a common or is a common uh, practice among some denominations? Well, here's what history reveals for us. The Catholic Encyclopedia records in the 1913 edition that according to plating that Pope Vitalian introduced the organ into the church service around the year 666. This, however, some would say is very doubtful. At all events, a strong objection to the organ in church service remained pretty general 
up to the 12th century, which may be accounted for partly by the imperfection of the tone. They didn't sound right. The organs didn't sound good at that time. But from the 12th century on, the organ became the chosen instrument in some denominations. So some will say it was around the year 666 when Pope Italian brought that in. Others will say that didn't really become a common practice until the 12th century. Here's what we know for sure. It didn't happen at least until 600 years after the New Testament. Now you think about that. Where in the New Testament do we find Christians using a harp or an organ or a guitar or a banjo or a piano or any of those type of instrumental music? We just don't find that. Friend, it's not part of the worship of the early church. Now remember, I'm to do what God commands me to do. If you love me, Jesus said, keep my commandments. John chapter 14, verse number 15. I'm to worship God in spirit, with my whole heart, soul, mind, and being, and in truth. John 4, verse 24. If I'm to worship God in truth, and God's Word, the New Testament, is our guide today. John 12, verse 48. Jesus said in Matthew 28, 18, All authority has been given to me. Then, friend, I want to worship God the way the New Testament teaches. Now, listen very carefully. You can read your New Testament, which is the Christian's guide today, especially on how to worship God in Christ. You can read from Matthew to the end of Revelation. In everything that God says about worship on this earth and about music in the Lord's church today, there is the absence of mechanical instruments of music. What does God say? 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 15, the Bible says, I'll sing with the Spirit, I'll sing with the understanding. What? I'll sing. There's the idea. Ephesians 5, verse 19, and Colossians 3, verse 16, we're to sing to one another in psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, singing and making melody, where? In your heart to the Lord. I'm to sing. I'm to teach. I'm to encourage. I'm to make melody in the heart. Everything we find in the New Testament is about singing. Is anyone happy? Let him sing psalms. James 5, verses 13 through 15. And so history clearly records it wasn't at least until 650 years maybe after the New Testament church was built and maybe 1200 before uh, instrumental music, mechanical instruments of music became a common practice. And we know that it wasn't a common practice in the New Testament, the very absence of it. And when God commands us to sing, God tells us what He wants, friend, that should suffice. Whatever God wants us to do, that's what we should do. And if God doesn't command it, then friend, we should not add to the Word of God. Revelation 22, verses 18 and 19. Now to another question that has been asked by one of our viewers. We live in a state where there are a lot of casinos and most people in our state gamble. Is it scriptural? Is it okay for a Christian to participate in gambling? Now friend, as we think about the subject of gambling, please realize what a huge problem gambling is today. Just like with any other type of addiction, alcohol, drugs, sex, whatever it may be, if one gets caught up in gambling, it is indeed an addiction. An addiction that takes away your interest, your time, and your energy, and your money eventually. And the Christian doesn't want to be given over to anything, doesn't want to be addicted to anything except Christ. 1 Corinthians 6 verse 12, Paul said, I will not be brought under the power of any. Is gambling controlling a person's life? If you're living from paycheck to paycheck, if you don't know, you know, if you're spending all your money on gambling, if you're at the casino instead of being with family and friends and things like under that, and it's just become an addiction, friend, it has power over you. It has control over you. It's dictating how you live your life. And Paul said, I'll not be brought under the power of any. Then consider these principles as it relates to gambling. The golden rule, what we often refer to as, in Matthew chapter 7, verse 12, Jesus said, Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. 
You think about this with me for a moment. The money that somebody may win in gambling, where's that money come from? Are they just printing it and giving away left and right? No. That money you win comes out of somebody else's pocket. That money that you won comes out of somebody else's losses. Would you want somebody to take that from you? Do unto others as you would have them do unto you? Would you want somebody to take your kids' food money? To take your money for your electric bill? To steal the money for your car payment? Or to take the money for your car payment? Of course not. I wouldn't want somebody to do that to me. Why would you take somebody else? People may be willingly involved in that, but that doesn't mean that you're not taking what they shouldn't have given to begin with. That they didn't have, they were addicted to it, it was a problem, and as a result, they lost things in that. And thus, a Christian wouldn't want to participate in that because I'm not really following the golden rule. I'm taking what somebody else really didn't have or shouldn't have given, and that would be contrary to the will of God. And then think about it this way. Colossians 3.17, here's the major problem, okay? Colossians 3.17, whatever you do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through or by Him. If what I do in my life, if everything I do, whether in word or deed, is to have the approval of God, then friend, where in the Bible does God sanction, where does God approve? Where does God say it's okay to gamble? You know, sometimes we, take, take, we approach the Bible and we say, well, God doesn't say not to. Wait a minute now. That's not how a Christian is told to operate. I'm not to operate based off of God didn't say I couldn't, so it's okay. Let me illustrate. Where's the passage in the Bible that says, Thou shalt not inject heroin into your veins? It's not there. Where do you find that? You don't find that. Does that mean it's okay for a Christian to do that? Well, of course not. I don't operate. The Christian is not told to operate off of the basis of thou shalt not, but rather, what shall we do? Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of, by the approval of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And so let's ask this question again. Where's the Lord's approval? Where does God say it's okay to gamble? And friend, you don't find authority for that in Scripture. There is no biblical authority anywhere in the Scripture for a Christian to gamble. It's not authorized. It's not sanctioned. Often, gambling is associated with evil things, uh, immorality, immodest dress, uh, drinking, alcohol, sometimes drugs and things like under that are definitely associated with gambling. And doesn't the Bible say in 1 Thessalonians 5.22, abstain from every appearance of evil? If those things are naturally tied to that, if that crowd runs with that, if it's not something that's going to promote right and good, rather it's going to promote wrong and evil, should I abstain from that? The Bible says I should. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 22. And so, should a Christian participate in gambling? Friend, you can find no authority for that in the Bible. God doesn't sanction that. And I'm taking what somebody else lost. I'm participating in their addiction and their problem. And that in and of itself is something that a Christian should not participate in. All right, the final question that we answer today as we think about our Bible question and answer series. And again, if you'd like to send in a question, you can do that through our email, questions at thegospelofchrist.com, or you can go to our website. We have a form that you can fill out, thegospelofchrist.com slash questions. You can submit those questions. We'll be happy to receive those and do our best to answer them from the Word of God. Now our final question. Well, I hear some people talk about the kingdom of Christ and says, I'm confused about what the kingdom of Christ is. What is the kingdom of Christ? Well, friend, there's no doubt a lot of confusion today about Christ's kingdom, although the Bible is very clear on that subject. There are those who would say uh, the kingdom isn't, isn't here yet, the kingdom's a future deal, going to be a thousand year reign, then the kingdom will be set up. Well, what does the Bible say about the kingdom? Friend, Jesus with great clarity promised he would build His kingdom. Mark 9 verse 1, Jesus said to His disciples, Assuredly I say to you, there are some standing here today who will not taste death until, 
there's the adverb of time, until they see the kingdom present with power. To Jesus' audience in that generation, he said, some of you aren't going to die until you see the kingdom here. That's a clear promise that it would come in the first century. Jesus taught us more about the kingdom in John 18, verse 36. When Pilate questioned Jesus, Jesus said, My kingdom's not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight. It's not a, it's not a geographical location per se. The kingdom is the domain of the king, and Christ's kingdom is a spiritual rule and reign of Christ the king himself. Is the kingdom here today in that spiritual rule and reign? You bet it is. Jesus said in Matthew 16, verses 18 and 19, I will build my church. And then he turned and said to Peter, I'm going to give to you the keys of the kingdom. The church and the kingdom are used synonymously. Christ is reigning as king, as head of the church. Ephesians 1, and 23. It is the spiritual rule and reign of Christ today, the Lord's church. And so when you hear the kingdom, that's used synonymously in the Bible with the church. And the church and the kingdom definitely are here. Listen to Colossians 1 verse 13. Paul said during the first century to Christians in the first century, Paul said that God had translated some out of darkness and had put them into the kingdom of His dear Son. There's the picture of someone coming out of sin obeying the gospel and becoming Christian. When they do that, they're put in the kingdom. Well, let's think of that in view of Acts chapter 2. These people in Acts 2 were pricked in their heart. They heard the message about Jesus. They realized they'd killed their own Messiah. They cried out, men and brethren, what shall we do? Peter responded by saying, repent. Be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. Acts 2 verse 42 and 43 tells us that those who gladly received His word were baptized. And listen to Acts 2 verse 47. And the Lord added to the church daily those who are being saved. The kingdom is the church. When men and women obey the gospel, they're added to the church. They are added to the kingdom. And friend, we ask you today, are you a member of the Lord's church? Have you obeyed that same gospel, that good news, that message, just like they did in Acts chapter 2? If not, we're encouraging you today. Won't you become a Christian? Won't you obey the gospel? Make sure your life is right with God while we have time and opportunity. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wife. This is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll free at 1-855-458-3905 or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111.